Right, so let's hope that's it and that we can finally start. So uh, I'm Mark SP, I have with the OpenSBSD project and I've been working on uh, how ports three and package tools and uh, well, <laughs> lots of other things related to that over the past 10 years. And uh, I wanted to make this talk about uh, quite recent advances, stuff we did very recently. For some of them, it was last week. <laughs> so obviously, if you're looking uh, into the OpenBSD tree, you won't find everything that I'm talking about in it yet. But uh, with luck, it should be committed in about a month or so. Uh, so those slides are not yet up, obviously, because I want you to listen to the talk first. <laughs> But uh, I should be able to upload them probably tomorrow, I expect. Yeah, very shortly. <laughs> so uh, this is not the first talk I have given about this topic. If you were here two years ago for the DPB part, then nice. If you don't know everything about it, there's going to be a very quick summary. Uh, this is our distributed port builder. It has been uh, in production use for about uh, two and a half years, I'd say. And uh, it's basically used by uh, everything in OpenBSD that builds packages for almost every architecture. You have at least uh, one port builder here who is uh, uh, doing Spark and maybe some other stuff. I don't remember. Yeah, so. Uh, is a mesochist, you see, because Spark, that's really old machine. I'm not talking Spark 64, right? <laughs> talking real stuff. Uh, it distributes uh, lots of our clusters, and uh, it has lots of very simple mechanisms, actually, that manage to distribute uh, the load quite uh, evenly and give very nice results in the end. So I think I have an example. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Two years ago, I said that there was a lot of stuff to do yet with DPB. So uh, I wanted to come back so that I could be able to tell you that most of that stuff uh, has been done and works now. And uh, we have done even more. And uh, now we are obviously running into new problems. Uh, but first, I'm going to talk about the stuff that we managed to solve. Uh, about those package pass problems, which I'm going to explain. Architecture dependence, which is very important for stuff like Spark because you don't want to have errors all over your uh, logs, for instance. Uh, fetching stuff, making things simpler for some of our people who are not here today, like Bob, for instance. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, LibreOffice, obviously. Uh, okay, this projector is a bit like shit, but it should be enough to see the graphs. Uh, this is what DPB looks like uh, when it finishes uh, running. So you have several curves here. Um, when it starts up, first it's scanning the port tree, and it's already building stuff right from the start. That's one very big difference from what we had before, is that uh, as soon as it finds something that it can build without any dependence, it starts it right away. So you basically have one scanning job on one machine, and everything else is already building. So you see here, you have actually two interesting queues. The red queue is the stuff that has been scanned but cannot be built yet because it's missing dependencies. And the blue one here is the stuff that we can actually build. So in normal usage, it goes up very, very quickly. So here we have about uh, 7,000 ports. And uh, about, uh, well, when it's finished scanning the port tree, basically, it already has uh, almost 3,000 ports that it can already build to choose from to try to find a very good build order. And uh, then it goes very slowly for a while. Uh, there is a very good reason for that, actually. It's that uh, since it knows what it's going to build and uh, what's going to take a lot of time, uh, in all of this part, you see those machines crawling because they are building huge things, like Qt4, GCC compilers, LibreOffice, stuff like that. And then, uh, near the end, on this part, it accelerates quite quickly. You see the queue going down. You notice that the stuff that cannot be built yet is almost uh, down to zero, so that, that this, by, uh, by this point, DPB has the whole port tree at its disposal. It can choose whatever it wishes to build next. And so the end of the queue almost always looks like this. Uh, the green line, that's actually the number of build package that you can install. And uh, on uh, every runner of DPB, you will see that in the end, it's an exponential. 
Usually, uh, for all common situations, you will see DPB and uh, building uh, packages on every machine in the cluster in parallel, and everything is going to end at exactly the same time. I should have some photo from uh, synchronized dancing or something like that, because everything ends within five seconds of each other, usually. So this graph was taken from OP, which is a cluster with six machines with two, with, uh, two cores each. Uh, it's almost an optimal setup for DPB these days, and, uh, until we get better SMP. And uh, I could have put a graph of uh, runs of DPB on other machines, but it would be very boring, because uh, the shape of the graph and uh, whatever you see here, it's mostly dependent on the actual port tree and how much time it's going to take to build stuff relative to each other, and not that much on which machine you are going to use, actually. So this graph is what I see on OP. It's also what I see on my laptop when I do the same thing. And it's also what I see on other machines like uh, Nadi's new box. The only difference, of course, is going to be time. If you have a slower machine, it's going to be stretched over three or four days. Uh, for OP, it usually takes something like uh, 11, 12 hours each. Ish. And of course, on uh, the Spark cluster, it takes, what, three weeks? Right. But it looks exactly the same everywhere. So how does it manage to do that? The very simple idea was simply that each time you are going to build the world pulse tree, you're going to store how much time it's going to take to build one given component. So when you go into the next iteration, you have the build times for each and every port. And you just use that to direct DPB in the right direction. So it can build the biggest dependencies first. We don't store the dependencies. That's a very important point. You only have to store the build times for each individual port. And since DBB will figure out the most current set of dependencies, if something changes, like for instance, suddenly we have lots of ports that depends on GCC 4.6. Then knowing how much time DPB uh, PCC 4.6 takes, how much time LibreOffice takes, and shits like that, it's going to figure out how to build things uh, in parallel so that uh, everything is built at about the same, the same time. Uh, it's very strange because I wrote this code and sometime I throw it some new workload and I see it do it uh, in a very efficient way and figure out critical path without me having to do anything. So this is a slightly different uh, graph, actually. Uh, do you notice the difference from the previous one? It's a bit tricky. Mm, not really. The difference is here. You have a green line that goes over for quite some time, actually. Yeah, I know it's a shitty projector, so you probably can see it. But on the previous build, the build ended here. Here it goes on for about two hours. So this is a problem. What happened, actually? Well, uh, you can talk all you want about uh, doing DPB, uh, loading stuff correctly so that things end uh, at the same time. But we actually have an elephant in our port tree. Strangely enough. The elephant, of course, is LibreOffice. If you look at the whole port tree uh, on OpenBSD, you'll notice that uh, sheets like LibreOffice is going to take about, uh, I think, one fourth of the full time it will take to build most of the rest. So in that case, which was a new machine with uh, two, well, sorry, a new cluster with two machines per eight core each, uh, there was the critical path, which was very easy to see, which was leading through GCC 4.2, GDK, and LibreOffice. And at the same time, you also had to have GCC 4.6 suddenly, and it didn't go fast enough. In the end, you saw the whole cluster trying to build that, and uh, ending up uh, building LibreOffice uh, while uh, other stuff was finishing and uh, still two hours to go and LibreOffice is not yet done. 
So this couldn't do, and uh, theoretical computer science is not going to save us again. So we're going to have to do practical stuff. Uh, interestingly enough, we had a very similar problem in Make, actually. So since I was working on Make at the time, I decided to maybe reuse the same idea. So let's have a small parenthesis. Uh, if you run builds using Max, you probably know about the problem you might run into if you try to do recursive Max. Like you have Make in a directory, you try to invoke it in parallel, and you go into a subdirectory and another subdirectory. And if you start with Make minus G4, for instance, you end up with 64 processes, usually. Your poor machine is not going to like that. So what we did actually is simply uh, try to figure out whether what we were running was recursive make. It's very easy. You just look at the command, and if you see anything that looks like make, uh, with a few exceptions, because you want to avoid USR include make or make.c, for instance. But apart from that, if you are running something that looks like make, you are going to decide, OK, I'm running a recursive make. And then you're not going to run into several of these because uh, you are going to start your processes normally. And as soon as you've started uh, uh, something that looks like make, then you stop st starting new processes. You just uh, hold on, wait for everything to finish, finish that one, and then keep going. So if you make a very simple computation, you're going to have four processes at the first level. But at most, only one of those processes is going to be make. So you are going to add four more processes at the next level and four more processes at the third level. So for simple recursive make with three layers, you end up with only 12 processes. And even so, that's probably a transient because the make at the first level, which, is, which started running, is going to block other stuff from starting until it finishes. So you are probably going to start with 12 processes, which are going to dwindle down back to one, then one, then four, so at most six processes. And a make which is running uh, something else in a different directory that doesn't consume much CPU. So in practice, we end up having recursive make working, making efficient use of uh, our CPU without any problem. So let's go back to DPV. What we did was very simple. Since we don't quite know uh, what's a recursive job in that context, we're just going to mark some very expensive ports as uh, being buildable in parallel. And of course, those ports are going to start on one core, but run with uh, make minus G, whatever. And at some point, your DPB is going to be running uh, more jobs than it's supposed to, right? Because you just started something that's expensive. You have other stuff that is still running. And you have maybe on a four-core machine uh, six or seven processes, right? But since those ports are very long-lived, like LibreOffice, eventually the rest is going to die. And instead of starting new stuff on the same machine, you're just going to steal the CPUs for your LibreOffice. And as soon as you started something big on one single machine, then you don't start anything else on that machine until you've gone down to the number of cores that you actually have. Uh, there's a very small trick to it, which is that if you have eight cores on your computer, you are not going to go full parallel and uh, say you are going to start make minus G8 to build LibreOffice. You're just going to use, by default, half of that. So transiently, you're going to have eight plus three processes. And very quickly, it's going to dwindle down again to eight processes. The main reason why it works is that you only have a few critical paths. So you only need to mark the big ports as being built in parallel using this method. And this just works. I could have put a new graph of uh, a new run on the same machine that you saw before. 
but it would be now, again, the same as OP. Because now, with just this small tweak, well, it took a few times to, to, to fix it, because each time you have to run the patch and check that it works and change it again. And now again, uh, we are able to build uh, the full port three on a 16 core cluster, more or less, uh, without uh, having any stragglers like LibreOffice uh, uh, being around for, ten for two hours at the end. So this is a bit of what I said. What are we going to mark as parallel uh, stuff? Only critical stuff, right? And also, only things that parallelize well. Because uh, if you build software, you know that some of that stuff is uh, crappy new stuff, for instance. And it's going to spend uh, most of its time doing configure, and then building part of it, and then configuring again, and then trying to build other stuff. Shit like that. Uh, actually, in what we are doing, a little bit of configure is going to help. Because if you try to build a port using parallel make, right, the patch, the, sorry, extract, patch, configure part, is going to be sequential anyways, even if you start it with make my UG4. In our case, that means that you have a few minutes, critical minutes, during which your big port is not actively stealing CPUs, and in which other stuff is going to be able to finish. So that helps. So, yeah, again, what I said. Um, we did some more work on this, because uh, just marking a few ports does help full bulk builds. But we have a few not so critical ports marked as well, so that, for instance, if you only want to rebuild 200 or 300 ports from the OpenBSD tree, uh, you will benefit from it as well. Stuff like Jlib is marked in my tree, for instance. I'm not sure it's made it to the general tree yet. And uh, in practice, most of the time, if you have 16 cores and you have stuff marked with parallel, you'll notice that you really have 16 processes running and not more. The transient part where you have started a big thing and uh, you have more, more sheet running is going to be very small compared to, to the normal work we built. Any question about that part? Uh, can you speak, uh, sorry, I missed the part. What, what does what mean? Uh, ah, right. Uh, I mean that uh, with this change, instead of having LibreOffice finishing two hours after everything else, uh, LibreOffice finishes, and then you still have two hours of a very small sheet building uh, to, to end the work. So you have plenty of room. If uh, it gets bigger or something like that, it will still work. Um, some other technical stuff. Running fetches. It's a uh, callback to what I was doing two years ago with DPB. Because at that point, uh, DPB only knew about building stuff, and sometimes it could be frustrating. Because uh, you have your machine, uh, which is sitting around doing nothing, just grabbing stuff with DPB. Uh, it was something that had to be known. It was not very complicated to do. But basically, since this is object-oriented Perl, uh, I just needed to kind of tweak the engine and uh, add another variation of the engine that instead of building stuff, would just simply uh, fetch stuff, grab stuff from FTP, and uh, run it uh, through another queue. Uh, so priority is important here as well. Since... Uh, of course, fetching stuff uh, won't uh, take any CPU bandwidth, but you don't want to be fetching uh, 20 uh, distribution files at the same time, or otherwise some people are really not going to like you. Um, one very good thing about this is that it made life simpler for some of our developers, like Bob Beck and uh, Tom Miller, who are the guy who are running the uh, these files mirrors. Because prior to that, it uh, required a lot of uh, handling. 
and looking at error logs and shits like that. And uh, at some point, we, we reach a point where the dispatch mirror were almost never up to date, which is usually a bad thing. So instead of that, the new DPB method uh, just works. <laughs> I don't know what I can say about it, but uh, it gives us uh, shitloads of log, uh, error reports that are readable and that you can fix. Uh, method to actually go through the FTP list quite quickly and uh, figure out uh, which one is going to work and stuff like that. Uh, I have on my to-do list somewhere to maybe even classify whether some uh, mirror is good or not good and uh, preferentially go to the SourceForge mirror that works, for instance. It's not been necessary so far. It's good enough for what we do. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, last thing to say about that is that uh, it also handles uh, all kind of shit concerning uh, checksums so that uh, we can build a little bit faster because actually once we fetch a file and uh, discovered that it has the right checksums, we won't recheck again. Uh, some people are going to say it's bad for security, but you have to realize why you are using checksum, right? You have your ports machine, you're building stuff on it, and uh, if anything gets tampered with on that machine, basically, you're fucked. The only reason we have checksums, of course, is to check whether the FTP uh, upstream is good or not, right? Uh, this brings me to the next part of this talk. Our beloved users. Well, uh, this projector is a little bad, but maybe you've seen this stupid movie, which is called Dumb and Dumber. That's basically some of our users. In that case, that would be probably Antoine and uh, Theo. <laughs> we have the uh, two most annoying guys in existence, between Theo, who is never happy with how things work, and uh, Antoine, who basically said, uh, nah, I can't use the PB. Uh, I don't want to have to put any options to it. So you write a main page, you write a complex program, you give it uh, lots of options, and you have this guy who is uh, going to tell you, nah, I'm not going to use it, it's too complicated for me. <laughs> Guess what? He's right. It doesn't have to be complicated. Well, uh, there are some cases in which those options are useful, but that shouldn't be always. And for the simple case of just building stuff, you should be able to just run DPB and that's it. And two years ago, that wasn't the case. Because all that stuff that I was talking about, uh, for, for instance, uh, being able to use the information from previous builds to prime the current one so that everything ends at the right time, it was an option. So he never used it, he never benefited from it. And uh, instead, we switched to a different approach. It was a little bit of code to write. It's a little bit more complicated for me, but my users are happy now with it. Uh, the idea being quite simply that uh, instead of uh, keep having to say where the log of a previous build is, I just store a journal of what's been going on before. In a place that's not going to go away, it's stored uh, with these files usually. And uh, it's just a rolling log, so if it goes too old, it just vanishes. But usually, I think I keep the information for the 10 last previous builds of a given port. And on average, I get pretty good build information as far as the time it takes to build one piece so that I get percentage and so that I get optimal builds. It turned out to be surprisingly useful for these files. Uh, there was one problem with mirrors is that uh, over the time of a, over the life of a port 3, these files are going to accumulate. Each time you get a new version, you're going to fetch it. So for stuff that changes quite often, like LibreOffice or Mozilla, and which has big these files, it's soon going to be a problem. So at some point, we want to remove all stuff. But how do you decide uh, uh, what's all stuff in the port 3? especially for Mirror, which has to cater to users, 
who are using versions from two years ago, versions from one year ago, uh, snapshots, all that shit. You can't rely on the timestamps for a file. It doesn't work. Because the timestamp just tell you, tells you sorry, the first time the file was fetched, not the last time it was used. Nope, just a log in that case. Access time is not really reliable in many cases. Each time you start DPB for a full build, uh, it will scan for, for the dist files and uh, it will mark, okay, this one we've seen. And if it doesn't see a given this file, it will say, okay, this is the first time we haven't seen this one. So afterwards, you actually have timestamps time that tell you this, still, this dist file with that specific checksum disappeared at that time. It can come back. For instance, if later, if it was a mistake or we upgraded and we got back to a previous version, then this timestamp, uh, this file is no longer used, will vanish. And so you keep exactly the files that you want, and you can even say, okay, I just want to pull my disk files for uh, two years ago, for instance. Uh, same thing, same thing. Uh, most of the stuff that's currently in DPB, you don't need options to use. For instance, if you want to have extra parallelism, it's on by default now. Uh, I think that it took maybe a week uh, between the time uh, I added the option and the time I decided to make it a default. Just make it work and uh, trash the GNOME. Well, keep it around, but uh, only for a very specific case. By default, uh, you have half your cores uh, from on one given machine which are going to be used to build the big stuff. And so uh, it's very good for Antoine because now if he wants to build the world, he just has to say DPB and it works. No options. If you want to use DPB on a cluster, again, it's very simple. All you need to have is your port tree under NFS. Set up things so that uh, on the local machine, uh, your work object here is going to be uh, local. You definitely don't want to build things for NFS. You would have to be crazy. Uh, make sure the base system is the same. That's the current tricky part. It's going to get better. And that's all, folks. You just have to tell DPB, okay, uh, I want you to run on this machine, that machine, that machine, and that machine, and that's it. There were a few issues to fix, because in order to work, it has to have access to NFS on a timely basis, and uh, NFS is a pile of crap. So it doesn't always work. Sometimes files show up uh, with a small time lag. And uh, so there's special casing inside the PB to say, okay, I'm supposed to have finished this package. It uh, hasn't shown up on this machine yet. It's not a problem, I'm going to wait for a bit. Helps on, uh, probably on Spark a lot. Overall crap, we still have Vexen, at least one. <laughs> we have a guy who is uh, stupid enough to do builds on it. And uh, it only has 32 megabytes of um, uh, memory uh, usable for a given process data. But uh, it's data limit. <laughs> So I had to give it some special love so that it fits. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it has to avoid the fetch part, which isn't really a big problem, considering that all those machines usually run from the same network, and so they actually share their uh, distribution files. And right now it fits. I think that the last I've seen it, DPB was uh, running on something between 28 and 30 megabytes. So if we grow the part three too much, we'll have a problem again. But it's not much of a problem, really, because the only reason we are still running DPB on the VAX itself, it's because it's cool to be able to, well, some people think it's cool to be able uh, to run uh, modern stuff on old shit. <laughs> but, uh, 
it's quite possible to drive uh, the whole build process from a machine which is from a different architecture. Absolutely no problem with that. Uh, errors. How much time do I have left? I probably need to cut some stuff. I had so much shit I wanted to talk about, but I decided to cram it at all, so probably need to cut some shit. Uh, yeah, our package system is a bit complicated these days because we have also packages and drivers and everything. Yeah, I'm being to be a bit long. <coughs> and uh, it all works most of the time, but DPB has to deal with all the strange stuff. Uh, in particular, we have something which is called pseudo packages, which is that sometimes on some architectures you have to get some stuff to vanish. Like for instance, uh, if you want to build Hawaii, it normally has a mono component, but mono only builds on MD64 and uh, E386. So it doesn't, it can build that on Spark, even though the rest should probably build. So what we did was simplify stuff, so that one, it's easy to build a make file that works for specifically this case, and two, so that DPB is aware about it, and so that if you are running something which isn't mainstream architecture, and there is some stuff that you can build because it requires assembly, a logs, patch it, uh, it won't even try to build it and not flag it as a new one. This is a big progress compared to what we were doing before, because now you can run a DPB on Spark and uh, actually see only package that built and uh, not shitloads of uh, how many errors? 500 maybe? Maybe more? I don't know. Thousands. Thousands and thousands. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, if you want to start playing with OpenBSD, uh, building ports on our machine is very simple. <laughs> no, I was not thinking about you actually. <laughs> but if you want to take it for yourself, fine. <coughs> and uh, more seriously, what's important is that uh, in the end, we uh, have snapshots almost all the time for almost every architecture. Right now, these days, uh, Nadi is building an MD64 snapshots, I think, each day, or each two days. So that's how fast we can crank things out with uh, fast machines. And still with Spark, well, I think we could have one snapshot every month, for instance, without any problem. Oh, uh, yeah, and another important part is that uh, usually kernel people don't talk to ports people, and vice versa. Yeah, but what's true now is that you have no excuse if you're working on the kernel to try DPB to try to figure out why our SMP is not very fast and shit like that. There's no point. The snapshot passes are good enough. <laughs> if you say so. Yeah. Uh, last thing about production, uh, I'm going to talk about this very quickly. Um, is that uh, for people who are actually using DPB for production, you don't have to stop it, you can just fix errors, remove the log file, and it keeps going. Yeah, that's part I'm not going to talk about. Um, basically, just that we have much better ways to control dependencies these days, so that we are able to uh, remove stuff that's not marked as a dependency from a port on a given machine. This has two advantages. One is that uh, when you end up building the whole port tree, you don't end up having 2,000 packages installed on your machine. And the second part is that we catch hidden dependencies. Stuff that hasn't been declared, but that new stuff, auto crap, is going to pick up on anyways. Uh, another thing that's been happening very recently is that uh, I took what I did in EPB and I realized, wait a second, what we are doing in make is completely wrong. It's way too complicated. So instead of forking one process for each target in make, now we do it the same way that we do DPB by using one single process for each command we are going to run, which means much better control, which means that we don't need a pipe since make is doing most of the printing. And so, all kinds of benefits in parallel mode. We have TTY, we have better errors, etc., etc.
Yeah, thread stuff and uh, VFS locking. But those are the main two problems with DPB these days. Um, I have plans. Uh, I should be German in that case because I'm going to take over the world, you know. Uh, I've started playing with uh, using DPB uh, to build not only the port tree but uh, Xenocara as well. And source is next on the list. And it works. At least for X. This is a full build of Xenocara done by DPB. And the drops you see here, this is the critical path. Uh, this part is X11. This part is uh, GL. And this part is the X server. Any questions? Uh, yeah, one point I've forgotten to mention. All I've talked about uh, concerning parallelism is in DPB now in the commentary. Chunking works as well. Uh, all the mixed stuff has been committed. Uh, the part that's still in progress is uh, using DPB to build X and eventually source as well. For now, it's only working over NFS, so uh, there's some sense of uh, speeds of the nodes, but that was already uh, done two years ago, which is that you can say that this machine has got a small speed factor, for instance, compared to another one, and then uh, it will take the whole queue of stuff it can build, and uh, it will uh, speed the workload into parts so that the slowest machine gets the smaller part to build, and the fastest machine uh, has access to the whole queue. Uh, right now, it's supposed that it's on a local cluster and uh, every disk file is accessible for NFS. I, we haven't had any practical use for that part yet. Just 10 seconds, I st probably still connected. Yeah. So, this is the PB working. What you're seeing here is the OP cluster which is located uh, elsewhere. And uh, what you're seeing here is about uh, something like uh, six machines running. Uh, I think that Landry wanted to try it with uh, three, three jobs per CPU. So you see here uh, 18 uh, ports building in parallel. And I don't know if you can read it, but uh, each port uh, actually has a percentage number right at the end of the line, like for instance here. Uh, which is telling you that, uh, okay, compared to previous builds, it's about 38% uh, uh, through the build. And the lines at the top means that it's the stuff that's been building the longest. So you'll see that it's managed uh, to start Chromium fairly early. And LibreOffice is still building. It's going to be here for at least three hours more, I guess. Uh, maybe a bit more. And uh, the, the end of the list is going to be moving fairly quickly, really soon, because uh, we are actually reaching uh, smaller ports here. And at the end, uh, you probably can't read the numbers, but I can tell you that we have built uh, 802 packages. The queue is already at uh, 5,700, and there are still 1,300 packages that we don't have all the dependencies for. This is what goes on about uh, once a day, with almost no human intervention. Thank you. <laughs>